Hello, every PlayStation buddy! I always wanted to say that. Well, anyway, it's time for another GameCast episode, and this time we're going to cover the hot new Sony PlayStation 3 game, The Last of Us, with an imminent release this coming Friday, June the 14th. And since I'm not a PlayStation owner yet, I thought I'd bring on a guest by the name of Mike Schultz, who's not only a PlayStation 3 and PC gamer, but he's also worked at Sony Entertainment as a game tester. So now let's meet Mike and find out what he's all about. Take it away, Mike. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, thanks for having me on. So yeah, my name is Mike Schultz and I, I'm from the gaming industry. Um, I have worked at a number of um, popular gaming studios. First started out at, at EA um, and then moved on to Sony. Um, nice. Yeah, and then I uh, went to Perfect World Entertainment, which is a like free to play MMO company um, mm-hmm. and from then on um, the social gaming trend kind of blew up and I then moved to Zynga and Digital Chocolate and the Playforge and you know as you know Zynga is a big Facebook um, game developer yeah. and Digital Chocolate is as well um, and the Playforge is a mobile games developer. Mm-hmm. Wow so uh, in when you were working at uh, Sony, that was actually right here in the neighborhood, and right in my neighborhood um, in Foster City, which is and I think their headquarters where you probably worked is just four blocks away from my apartment. So um, that's yeah. we really are in the the center of gaming in Silicon yes. Valley, yeah. and and it's it's a great place to be if you're a gamer. <laughs> Absolutely, and, yeah. And even though we met, We're just interested in, in technology in general. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, yeah. That's how we met. I mean, we we worked at the same technology company, which had absolutely mm-hmm. nothing to do with games, but it's you true. Get the idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then, so what was your uh, favorite um, games that you tested in these different companies? Um, well, uh, I would have to say The Sims 3 um, mm-hmm. was definitely one of my favorite and, and the most popular. Um, yeah. I, I worked on the base game of that. You know, there's about 12 expansions, mm-hmm. probably 12 plus expansions already released for that game now. But I, I was on base game, um, worked on that title for for about eight months. And before that, mm-hmm. I was on um, some smaller Sims games. Um, mm-hmm. And I also tested Hellgate London. Um, for a little bit as well. Oh, nice. um, yeah, and so then, yeah, so then, and then at Matt, and then at uh, Sony, um, I tested Mag, uh, which was mm-hmm. that really crappy, uh, massively multiplayer first-person shooter. Um, <laughs> what's, it, it, what's it stand for? What monster? What's it? <laughs> uh, stands for massive action game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really creative. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, well, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize that some some game testing cycles last that months, so or that last that long, like eight oh, months yeah. for The Sims, huh? Yeah, I mean that's actually. I mean, I I don't. I hope it. Well, I think it was eight months. I mean, mm-hmm. I was there for almost a year. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the the good chunk of my time was definitely testing The Sims Three. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, yeah, that that's pretty pretty standard for games. Yeah. Uh, well, development yeah, that's not, cycle. Yeah, that's not surprising. Yeah, assuming how the development cycle for some of these games can be as long as four years, or in the case of Duke Nukem, um, the new one, what was that like? Twelve years, right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, it was terrible too. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> but the the Last of Us. I mean, this is a game. I bet you would have loved to have tested if you oh, were absolutely. still at Sony. And um, there, and this has been in development for. I believe three years, right? Mm-hmm. At least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. About was, about two three years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If I yeah, if I'm not mistaken, it was announced at the end of 2011. So we've been waiting for like a year and a half for this. Mm-hmm. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about the uh, the general flow of the game, like maybe the plot and the characters in the game? Uh, I've noticed so far that um, it's generally kind of like a survival horror. Yeah. Game. Yeah, it's a third it's not person nece- mm-hmm. action survival horror game. Yeah. yeah, not necessarily a zombie um, genre type of game, but um, but it's more like a gritty survival horror with where your weapons are limited and the weapons are falling apart. <laughs> but exactly, it what yeah. appears to be that appears to be so at least. And Joel, whom you control as the main character, is yeah. the one who wields most of these weapons. And um so why don't you talk a little bit about the uh, the characters? 
Yeah, so um, Joel is a black marketeer who basically sells goods and resources to uh, the United States military-controlled um, cities, um, the quarantine zones of mm-hmm. um, the city. So that is, you know, what kind of his role is to survive. Um, and he has, you know, this this pseudo girlfriend, I, I guess. Um, her name is Tess, mm-hmm. and uh, she's also a black marketeer. You know, they they do whatever they need to do to survive. And you know, um, the game actually starts, you know, two decades after this outbreak has taken place. And oh, so, see, you know, right. you can imagine, I mean, at that point, you know, people have taken up, you know, kind of shady professions um, in, you know, as a means to survive. And so mm-hmm. um, that's them. And they come across Ellie, who is the, you know, little teenage girl um, who is actually not controlled ever by the player. Um, but so they meet her through an unexplained event that happens in one of the quarantine cities, I believe, uh, starting out in Pittsburgh. Um, and it it then turns into Joel, you know, promising a friend of his that he will get Ellie to the Fireflies, which is a extremist militia group, um, in, in in Boston, I believe. In Boston, right. Yeah. Right. And, and Ellie being an AI character, she is kind of like the, uh, uh, the supporting lead, uh, mm-hmm. through the whole game. And, um, immediately I drew parallels between her and Elizabeth from Bioshock Infinite. Oh, and, yeah. and by looking at some of the gameplay, it looks like the mechanics are roughly the same too. You kind of learn how to play the game in the introduction mm-hmm. or, you know, those opening scenes by watching how Joel and Ellie interact. Right. And that's exactly what, well, not exactly what happens in Bioshock infinite because you don't meet elizabeth for a while and by that time you've learned half of the game but you've only learned about half of the game and this this game also sounds like roughly as epic as uh bioshock infinite you know it's a 12 to 16 hour um uh, story to Mm -hmm. and you can easily double that if you're my kind of gamer that likes to explore everything and there's plenty of opportunity for exploration it sounds like too even though it's a fairly linear game and we'll talk about that in a minute yeah and so you mentioned mentioned uh, an outbreak so why don't we mention the the source of the zombieism like what happens in this game Right, so the source of the outbreak is um, due to a cordyceps fungus. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, you know, it's a plant-driven toxin uh, fungus that uh, infects, you know, millions and millions of people um, right. in the United States. And uh, I think it's in the United States. I'm not sure if it goes worldwide, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the United States. And um, the early idea of this game came from... Um, the BBC Planet Earth, um, where they were showing a cordyceps fungus infecting an ant, I and see. Um, you know the it's a crazy uh, you know infection that that kills this ant eventually, and you know at that point the fungus erupts from the body of the ant and then you know releases spores right. to anything that comes around it, and it's really you know pretty freaky stuff, um, <laughs> and. I, I thought it was really interesting how they took that and applied it to humans um, for this story because I think that's a really interesting way to bring on a zombie apocalypse. Right, because um, it's still very believable. Yeah, like, I don't think yeah. I, I don't think we're going to see those ants in the game as a, like a zombie fire <laughs> ants or anything. But, yeah, yeah. yeah but, I mean, you know, it is a really interesting way, and because I mean, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, in most zombie stories, you don't really get an explanation on what was the source of the infection, you know, and, right, and if right. and if you do, it's something really boring, like a strain of rabies or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. And so, yeah. um, or if a TV yeah. series is successful, or if a game's successful, then they'll they'll hurry up and build a backstory, yeah, because they didn't realize how popular it would get. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I mean, then, but I, even when like you know you're talking about like you know currently The Walking Dead. Um, mm-hmm. I still don't know. You know, I don't. I don't think there is still an explanation of, you know, that 
virus. Right. It's mostly flashbacks, which which don't exactly explain everything. And but but it is somewhat. I actually believe in Walking Dead's case, it's a some type of weaponized virus, if I'm not mistaken, exactly. uh, like weaponized smallpox or some some type of thing like that that got out of control. Yeah. And, and that's also believable because that's actually happening right now. It's it, we just don't see it um, affecting a. a affecting a population worldwide like a outbreak like this does in the yeah. game. All right, and even though Naughty Dog doesn't want us to think of this as a zombie game, um, you know, that's it it has its roots in zombieism and zombie games that started way back in the the late 90s. Um so why don't we talk about a short history of all that of that specific genre, the zombie genre? Right. So, I mean, zombie games have actually been around ever since the, the ZX Spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I mean, and they, they've made their way, you know, through the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo and, mm-hmm. and all, all the major platforms, right? But I think that the, the catalyst that started this whole zombie craze, um, in my opinion, was Call of Duty World at War with their Nazi Zombies mode. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, even classic games like Resident Evil, um, which came out well before that, Mm -hmm. I don't think had as much of an impact um, in mainstreaming zombies in video games. Um, (laughs) That's actually what I thought you were going to mention. (laughs) I thought that's the one you were going to say, but no, Call of Duty, huh? (laughs) Yeah, um, I mean, because in in the same year and and shortly after that, you know, we got, got, um, you know, titles like Left 4 Dead and Mm -hmm. and Dead Space and then Dead Island. Um, you know, which have all had steady sequels and, you know, remain strong franchises throughout the years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, I don't know about Dead Island, but, you know, definitely Left 4 Dead and Dead Space, you know, has a huge following. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I think that, you know, even, not even in, in, in console gaming, I mean, you know, zombies are a big theme in mobile gaming as well and on Facebook and it's just, I don't know why, but but the entertainment industries like mm-hmm. love zombies. And, well, they're uh, easy to target. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're easy. Well, they're not necessarily easy to kill, but they're but most of them uh, like stagger around slow enough to shoot. I think that's why. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, I don't know. Like, it just seems like after World of War, you know, we we get all of this zombie theme stuff and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even even when the new, all the new Call of Duty is coming out now that are developed by Treyarch, um, you know they they have their you know they'll, they'll continue the zombie Nazi mode or you know the zombies mode, mm-hmm. and th- that game I think has can I mean I think people people don't buy Call of Duty for the single player experience. I mean, let's face it. I mean, people people buy Call of Duty for the multiplayer experience, yeah, of right? Course. Yeah. But now, I mean, they they even buy it for the zombie experience. So, it it's hmm. it's created enough fans to have a following just for the zombies aspect of of that game. Wow. And I think that's awesome, you know, and mm-hmm. it's really cool. I mean, and it was totally unexpected. Um, but people just ate it up and um here we are, you know. That is odd that I I didn't really even think about that. In fact, I had totally forgotten that there was, such, and that's really just a um, it was a spinoff title, wasn't it? Uh, the call it the the zombie, uh, the Call yeah. of Duty zombie uh, game. Yeah, yeah, it was called Nazi Zombies, and it was, it was only unlocked when you would beat the game. Um, uh-huh. It was kind of like a like an Easter egg in it in a way, right. you know. And, and hmm. but uh, it was it had its hold. Yeah. Can you think of any other games that have something like that? I can actually think of one. Well, DayZ is the one that comes to mind. Uh, DayZ oh, yeah. is a mod based from which which game? Is it a Half Life mod? It, uh, no, DayZ is it's a Arma Arma oh, right. Two mod. Okay. Yeah, Arma Two. Right, right, right. I never played Arma Two, um, but and I, I oh, I've got it in DayZ. my Steam, and I never opened it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, I think it's. I just think that that title is amazing just because you know what you can do with mods nowadays is incredible mm-hmm. I mean you can essentially just build your own new game off of you know a mod and it's right. it's right. crazy stuff um, yeah and a zombie a zombie uh, setting is perfect for that I think yeah so um 
Also, so we mentioned Pittsburgh and Boston. So those are the main cities where this takes place. Uh, so obviously, it's an, like an American horror flick, mm-hmm. you know, that you're that you're pushing the main character through. But then the environments include all sorts of. Um, different uh, mashups of things like forests. You know, there's buildings. Yeah. There's. It looks like there's also ravines. There's bridges. There's snow. In, yeah. Oh yeah. Even snow. Yeah. Uh, there's, and then there's interstates of you know like wrecked uh, wrecked cars as far as the eye can see. Yeah. Which reminds me of every time I see that, I, it reminds me of Fallout, um, which is my favorite my favorite franchise, by the way. Yeah. And. Um, uh, then we even have things like uh, the forest reclaiming a city again. Like you know, we'll see that in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Um, nature's reclaiming the city again, and yep. which makes it look like a Crisis Three or even a what was that Will Smith movie? Um, I am Omega or no? I am Legend. I am Legend. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That it, this really reminds me. The trailers reminded me of I Am Legend very much. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, so there's the setting. Um, and, and we mentioned that it, it's not really a zombie game, but a, a survival game that you know that could last uh, up to 16 hours uh, in the main quest, or well, actually not the main quest. There's one story, and there's also a multiplayer component to this game. And honestly, I didn't research it that much because um, the focus should actually be on the single player experience in a game like this, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the focus obviously is going to be the single player. I mean, this game's not going to be remembered for you know, it's multiplayer. It's going to be remembered for the single player experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, Naughty Dog has worked so hard to, you know, deliver such a intense experience and um, a really well-rounded game that, I don't know, multiplayer just, there's just so much disconnect, I feel. Um, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah. I mean, you know, at the same time, you know, there's people that enjoy multiplayer and you got to please everybody. But, yeah. you know, I almost feel like for this just given the plot and given you know how how serious this game is, I mean, multiplayer just seems so out of place. And there's there's games that just totally don't need it. Like, for example, I mean, I don't know if you've ever played Heavy Rain, but mm-hmm. you know, a great game that you know totally, in in my opinion, revolutionized gaming um, right. in terms of just its its really innovative gameplay. Um, and it it didn't have a multiplayer aspect. I mean, what room would there be? in that game to have one, you know, nothing. Right. And right. so, I don't know, I, I just feel like it's just totally not necessary. Yeah, the multiplayer components of some of these games are just so quickly forgotten. Like like that, uh, Bioshock 2, th- that multiplayer was pretty much gone within a matter of months. I never heard yeah. anything about it ever again. Yeah. Crisis 2 had a multiplayer that was gone as soon as right. it was released. Dead Space were... 2, terrible yeah. multiplayer. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but um, we also mentioned a, a little bit about the weapons, but um, that's one of my favorite parts of these uh, survival games are the, the gritty weapons that you, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what few weapons you can get your hands on. So it sounds like this game is the same um, way with when you're faced with um, how to defend yourself. You, you've got just a couple of weapons. They're they're pretty crude. I'd notice that there's some. Um, there's like a hatchet. There's some blade weapons. Uh, there's a few guns. Mm-hmm. So what what have you seen? And there's also some throwable weapons like Molotov cocktails. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, you know, there's a reason why you're going to be constantly searching for resources scattered throughout the world. Um, and it's the the reason of your survival. I mean, you need to be scavenging these resources in order for you to survive in this world. And mm-hmm. uh, I think it. I think they Naughty Dog did a really good job on um, kind of presenting that element and you know making you feel like wow like resources are limited Um, yeah I really need to find everything I can get and craft things either offensively or defensively um, to you know get through um, any situation Um, and so you know all these resources are used to craft um, a wide array of weapons and supplies Um, you know for Mm -hmm. example you can take um, you know a bottle of alcohol that you found and maybe you have like a rag already in your pack right well you can Mm -hmm. combine those two things and you can make a Molotov cocktail Uh, or you can take the same ingredients and you can make a med kit 
Mm -hmm. um, and so it gives a player a choice in how they want to progress through the world. And I mean, as a gamer, I love to create my own story within the story. And right. um, if I if I come up on a situation where, you know, I feel like I'm going to be outnumbered, um, maybe I'll just craft some med kits um, just in case, you know, and, and not throw that Molotov. Um, right. right. But you know, what that where's the fun in that? I would rather light some people on fire <laughs> right and then also aiming these weapons at at your enemies i've i discovered through the gameplay that it's very difficult i mean very realistic it's not just a matter of aiming through a, uh, a reticle or an iron sights you mm -hmm. know you've it really it really gives you the feeling that you're that you're fighting on the run and right. you can't you can't aim properly uh sometimes you have to fight upside down i saw a clip where where the the main character got ensnared and he was hanging upside down on a rope how can you possibly aim when you know all the blood's going to your brain and your yeah no t totally and i mean i think i i actually saw a video i think it was in one of the um developer diaries that uh, uh they were showing you know a, a ranged weapon attack and and the reticle was auto like auto focused mm -hmm. on the target so i think i mean i think there's an option to, to turn it off or on oh i see um, so i mean I, I would imagine so Mm -hmm. um, but I'm gonna probably play it off just because. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to play a game like this at the hardest setting. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Um, um, so I mean, another example with the the weapons um, is you know, say you have like nails in your pack and and bandages, right? And mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, you know, twenty feet further, you find like a, a two by four on the ground or whatever. You know, you can take yeah. the nails. And then attach them to the two by four with the bandages, and now you have like a powerful melee weapon. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so it's, it's cool, and like you know, I also I saw that you can take nails and create like a bomb with it. And mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be really cool to to see all the different weapon and um, right. you know uh, defensive and offensive weapon combinations. Mm -hmm. Any crossbows? Uh, uh, I saw a bow and arrow, but I think that was the extent of the ranged weapons. Yeah, I mean, I'm not quite sure about on all the weapons. Um, uh -huh. You know, I can't really name them off off all the top, but right. uh, I mean, yeah, you definitely have you know your shoddy, your shotgun, and your pistol, and mm -hmm. uh, which is probably you know scavenged by all of the you know uninfected that are in the world too. And the, all, everybody's it just seems like they're all bandits, you know, and then right. everybody's trying to just just it's survival of the fittest, and um, and oh. and that's the thing because you know playing. I would imagine that playing defensively, you know, would leave you with less resources uh, offensively as a play as opposed to playing offensively because you know you're looting the people that you would have killed and maybe looting stuff from the room they were in or whatever. So I mean, if you totally ignore situations, um, you know, it could maybe leave you vulnerable for the next encounter. You know, who knows? Right. You know? Yeah, and then just a. A minute ago, you mentioned survivors and um, uh, using weapons on the survivors. So we've actually got a couple of types of enemies. We've got survivors who are humans, uh, just like the just like Joel, um, who who might be attacking Joel for his resources. And then we've got infected, right? Who are essentially the zombies. Right. And um, and there's probably other enemies that I'm missing too. But um, what do you know about those? Um, I mean, not too much. Uh, I mean, I think the survivors are pretty self-explanatory. I mean, I think in this type of environment, it's survival of the fittest. So, you know, these guys are going to be trying to kill you and take whatever you have, um, you know, so they can fight the infected. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is a f another faction called Hunters, and I don't know uh, what they're about, but I'm sure they're hostile. They sound hostile, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure they are. In yeah. fact, you know, these different factions in The Last of Us, it's mostly humans. You know, I mean, you can't really think of the zombies as a faction. I mean, they're completely, you know, right. there's no organization to them. They're just out to kill you. But um, and, and these different factions are actually what, um, what, what you see in the multiplayer component. You know, you can belong to one of these factions. Yeah. Um, yeah, and while we're on the topic of crafting, why don't we talk about the UI of The Last of Us and just how seamless it is. Yeah, so, I mean, it really is um, seamless. Um, it's always live, um, and, you know, they, they wanted players to craft something at any point during the game mm -hmm. uh, with as little button presses as possible. And no menus, uh, right? 
No, well, barely. I mean, so you enter a menu that takes up half of your screen, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you can still see your character and what's around you, um, and what's mm -hmm. coming. You know, there's no pause in, oh, in this whatsoever. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, it, I mean, if you if you come up on a situation, you know, you can really take that split second to sit down or hide behind something to craft something real quick. It's a wow. really cool way to, you know, keep mm -hmm. you immersed um, in the action. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the UI designer... Um, Alexandra Neonakis she stated that you know one thing that she hates most about any game's UI is when it takes the player out of the game for too long and mm -hmm. I highly agree with that I mean especially in this game where you know it's so intense and the sense of urgency is always high mm -hmm. you know having to pause the game and go into a crafting option exactly. you know it, yeah. it's it's so disconnected from the action and, and what's going on and it doesn't really make you feel like you're you're immersed anymore in the game mm -hmm. and um What's another game that was successful with that no pause feature? It's uh, Dark Souls, I think. Dark Souls had no pause. Oh, really? But not. But Dark Souls didn't even have a map either. So that's. Oh, I wonder about. Yeah, what about the UI, the map UI here? Um, do you know where you're going, or do you know at least where you've been <laughs> in this well, game, or what? Yeah, I mean, you know, seeing how it, it's going to be a fairly linear game, right? Like. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you're going to be necessarily getting lost too much. I feel like I feel like the level design is going to be pretty good at directing you where you need to go, whether that be from Ellie guiding you at certain points or mm -hmm. or you know, um, just how buildings are set up and and you know, uh, environmental obstacles that you maybe have to overcome. Um, right. who knows, but I I don't think that there's going to be maybe I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some like map that you can view um but you know, who knows? Maybe it's like maybe it's like the crafting UI. Maybe you can just kind of open up a compass real quick on the screen, and it'll show you like where you are. And right, yeah. Right. Oh yeah, and then uh, it looks like you'll be also be able to interact with um, objects in the environment to get you through these environments, like, such as like a wooden plank, slapping a w picking up a wooden plank, and that all happens real time too, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Like you don't. Yeah. You don't it. Yeah, I don't know if it's. Um, kind of like a quick time event thing where you got to like mash like a button to like lift something or mm -hmm. I actually I think you I think that is actually how it is um mm -hmm. you know and if you're you're going to open something yeah or lift something you know you got to mash a certain button and then right. press another button to place it um yeah again I mean that's that's cool gameplay it's really it makes you feel like you know you're actually playing the game and, and doing you know things to to further um your progression so mm -hmm. yeah um, I mean and and you know like as far as like puzzles go, like I'm not sure about that, but um, I don't know. Tomb Raider was really the you know the new 2013 Tomb Raider. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you played that, but um, you were constantly interacting with the environment mm -hmm. to progress, and uh, it was it's a really awesome game. All right, so now let's touch on my favorite topic in any game, which is the graphics engine. So Naughty Dog had built this. Um, graphics engine that they used for The Last of Us, but it's their existing engine that they used for Uncharted. Uh, also Uncharted 2, and there, I think there's an Uncharted 3, right? I, I yeah. honestly don't know that much about PlayStation titles, because yeah. um, you know I'm not a PlayStation owner yet, but I will mm -hmm. be in November. Um, but they learned their lesson from uh, uh, their transition from PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3. They had this uh, engine from Jack and Daxter, um, back in 2004 and five, the first Jack and Dexter I think was 2001 but then when the PlayStation 3 was released which is 2006 I believe 2005 yeah. or 6 2006, they, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, they ditched that for a brand new engine and that caused all these delays so unfortunately um, um, you know that costs money and of course it doesn't make the gamers happy so they're, they're they opted to stay with this existing engine and then just continuously improve it. And, you know, other developers do that too, like Valve does that with its Source engine, or, uh, you know, the same thing with the Unreal engine. And, you know, it's only like 10 years later is this new Unreal 4 engine released. Right. Um, uh, so it's, it's a, all in all, it's a good strategy for the graphics, I think. Um, and speaking of Naughty Dog, so... Um, Sony releases a lot of exclusive titles, and they've used Naughty Dog uh, several times in the past. And w I think we just mentioned the games that they've um, that Naughty Dog has developed, right? Can you think of any others? I think it's that one, um, you know, the Uncharted series, and then Jack and Daxter, and anything else. 
Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, so all they've made is the Jack and Daxter series and Uncharted, and mm-hmm. now The Last of Us. Right, and The Last of Us being, like, brand new intellectual property. Um, yeah. And I'm sure they're going to, because it's obvious how popular this is going to be, I'm sure they're going to go many places with this new franchise, I think. Um, so why does why did Sony choose Naughty Dog? Or, you know, I noticed that they, they work with several studios, um... So why does Sony um, choose to work a lot with Naughty Dog uh, in the titles that it produces? Um, I mean, I think Naughty Dog is a really um, good studio in terms of, you know, telling a really great adventure story. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, you know, the Uncharted series just proves that. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, the the gameplay was amazing in the Uncharted series. Um, It's pretty, like, revolutionary for its time. Um, you know when they when they released the first Uncharted, and then right. the second char- Uncharted, um, I played that all the way through. Um, I haven't touched the third one yet. I mean, I've, I well, I have touched it, but only about I don't know, maybe an hour or so. Right. Um, and you know, it felt a lot of the same as two. But I mean, I just think Naughty Dog, they're a super cinematic game developer. I mean, mm-hmm. they take these stories, and it's almost like you know, a movie. I mean, the, the yeah. cut scenes are directed exactly like movies, and I mean, I wouldn't be surprised in the future if, you know, major movie studios came to these guys, you know, you know for help on a movie. Um, right, right. Yeah, They and, really know how to develop characters, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it, I think it's just, the, the Uncharted series has gotten a lot of fans throughout the years, and, yeah. you know, I think they totally just revolutionized themselves, you know, coming from like Jack and Daxter, which is like this like kind of kiddie, you know, adventure game to, mm-hmm. you know, making a super dramatic um, new IP with Uncharted. And now, you know, with The Last of Us, um, I feel like that studio just keeps skyrocketing upwards. And right. I mean, I think that's why right. Sony just, you know, loves to work with them. Yeah. It, and, and, and we call that like bankable in the gaming industry, you know, like a bankable developer. Anything they produce just because of its name, it's going to be successful. Yeah. No, definitely. <laughs> uh, you know, Bethesda is a good example oh, of yeah. that. It's yeah. like, you know, some of their, their stuff is, you know, arguably, um, you know, bug ridden yeah. and stuff, but still, th- these are epic titles that, yeah. Like, these I mean, even developers. Rockstar, I mean, like with GTA. I oh, mean, right. Yeah. Rock, I mean, even with, you know, Red Dead Redemption. I mean, that's a super. That's one of my favorite studios. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, also, so you mentioned that cinematic experience in The Last of Us, and that must be why uh, Naughty Dog chose a linear story, like a more linear gameplay versus an open world, for the for like a, a post apocalyptic survival horror. You know, the open world could do really well in in this environment, but not for this story, right? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean. Yeah, exactly. I don't. I don't think that an open world environment would lend itself good to this story. Um, I know that Naughty Dog has said that it's not going to be as linear as the Uncharted series. Um, however, I mean, I, I think that has to do with you know the choices that you can make, and you know if you want to play more defensively or offensively in terms of like the weapons that you craft, uh, or the you know you come up on situations that you know totally throw you off guard and you and you, you go oh wow I didn't expect it to end up this way mm-hmm. um, so I think they kind of throw curveballs at you in terms of that and I think that's why they're talking about it's not going to be so linear I see. Um, but yeah I mean in terms of the open world um, environment again I, I don't think it'll lend itself nicely to this this game mm-hmm. um, or would have n- lended itself nicely because when you when you play an open world game like you know for example you know you, you love Fallout right? right and so you I mean I tend to forget the overall main storyline when I'm playing these type those type of games because I go off and I do my own thing and you know I do side quests or I, I, I go and I, I climb this random mountain just to see how high I can get you know mm-hmm. I, I really just kind of play in the sandbox and that's what it is you know it's, right. it's a sandbox type game these open world games so mm-hmm. I lose myself in them a lot and I really forget about the story and I think right. that if they were to do that with this game it, it would not be it wouldn't, you know, be as engaging. Um, right, and The Last of Us was born from its story. So absolutely, you, know, you yeah. can't abandon that at all. Not right. even, not even for a chapter. Uh, yeah. and, and that's why I think there aren't really side quests. There's just different ways of approaching the same situ- mm-hmm. the same chapter each time. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then uh, there's something else that's been nagging me about The Last of Us. And it's or not just The Last of Us, but any PlayStation game and any Xbox game that's being released this summer. And the the question is, why didn't Sony just wait until the next gen release of PlayStation 4? Because uh, what from what I understand, the PlayStation 4 titles will not be backwards compatible with the place with uh, PS3 titles. In other words, you won't be able to play PS3 games on your PS4. So what the hell? Right. Well, I mean, according to the game director uh, Bruce Straley, um, you know, it was never a question at all during development to wait for the PS4. Mm. You know, the game had gone into development, you know, what three years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably way before Sony knew a release date for the PS4. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, on top of that, you know, he wants current PS3 owners to be able to experience this game. I see. Um, yeah, Naughty Dog, just... yeah. So, I mean, mm-hmm. Na- Naughty Dog is so happy with what they've accomplished, and you know, waiting for the PS4 just doesn't really right. make any sense. And even for the fans, and, and even financially, I would imagine, you know, I mean, not everybody is going to immediately jump on the PS4 when it comes out. I mean, I know oh, I'm not oh, personally. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. and I and I think you know, I think the PS3 is still going to be around for a long time and, and remain a a really strong platform in the years to come. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and, and I think you'd see some of the most popular PS3 titles being ported over to PS4 technology. I oh, absolutely. We'll yeah. see that a lot. And I mean, in terms of the, you know, whatever you want to talk about, oh, it's going to look better on PS4. I mean, the game looks absolutely gorgeous already on PS3. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's not like... I, I really don't think the jump from the PS3 to the PS4 is going to be so big as the jump from the PS2 to the PS3. Right. You know, and just in terms of the tech, I mean, you know, the tech in the PS4, while, you know, it's obviously better than what we have, Mm -hmm. it's still, like, pretty, pretty nominal in in its own right. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's only only got, what, like, 8 gigs of memory, and it's, you know, using a, it's using, like, its own NVIDIA um, card, but... I mean, right. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But, but 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 I mean, it, I have a I have a PC, a gaming PC that you know, well surpasses that those specs. And I know they have to like you know make it affordable in terms of manufacturing. They can't go too crazy with with the tech the, with the tech in it. But at the same time, I don't think that the games that that are going to be um, release titles for the PS4 are going to look you know, worlds better than what's already on the PS3. Mm-hmm. I mean, game, you know, they haven't, I don't think they've even reached the threshold yet in the Xbox 360 or the PS3 in terms of really what they can push out of you. I mean, I think each new game that comes out keeps looking better and better and better because they're finding, you know, new ways to take advantage of the hardware. And mm. I mean... Yeah, yeah, and actually, yeah, most of the most of the technology advancement in, in a console is optimization. Learning how to better optimize uh, even better than the previous title. And, and, and that's not such an issue for the PC because you you know PC hardware just reinvents itself every year and a half so you right. don't really have to optimize but exactly yeah, but you you really do have to on these consoles because once the PlayStation 4 is released that's going to be the the spec for at mm-hmm. least 2 years and that'll be yeah. the standard and you'll yeah. have to build games around that platform yeah i guess my point is that it's going to take like a few years for games to look super amazing i feel like yeah, yeah. yeah. well We've been talking our ears off about The Last of Us for the last 30 minutes, so I think we're out of time. But, Mike, I wanted to thank you for being on the show. I'm sure my fans really appreciate it. And um, any thoughts about being on a future episode? Oh, I would love to. Um, this is this is my first time, you guys, so you know, hopefully you uh, enjoy what I have to say. Um, but, uh, yeah, thank mm-hmm. you for having me on, and um, I look forward to future episodes, definitely. Yep, and I'll try to get... I'll try to get one out within the next few weeks uh, anything else coming out that you're excited for or not um well grand theft auto 5 mm-hmm. um i'm i'm definitely eagerly awaiting that hey and, well uh, there there's our yeah, next that, there's that, our next podcast <laughs> there we go there we go <laughs> all right <laughs> and i just wanted to throw out a huge thank you for everyone tuning into this show and tell me in a comment what game you'd like me to cover next and i'll pull some more guests in for the next episode We'll see you next time.